In an adult human, injury to the cerebellum is most notably going to cause motor problems, most notably ataxia. But there is a growing appreciation of non-motor functions of the cerebellum. So in, in one uh, impetus for this growing appreciation is the fact that almost all of neocortex projects into the cerebellum. It is not the case that just motor cortex projects in. It's, it is the case that frontal, cor frontal uh, cortical regions provide the bulk of the input to the cerebellum via the pontine nuclei, but it is, uh, it, it, in, in fact, most of the cerebellum, except for a few primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, um, a few places, they all project to one degree or another into the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is getting a lot of, of cortical input that is not strictly uh, or, or immediately ha uh, of a motor um, uh, nature. Probably the, mo the, the best studied and the best verified non-motor uh, function for the cerebellum is in, in language. And there are lesions in, you can imagine, if you have a stroke in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica, that takes out the posterior inferior cerebellum, which is the back lateral part of the, uh, of the cerebellum. When the right pica is affected, there tends to be uh, a language disturbance that is not strictly a dysarthria. It's not strictly a problem with speech or articulation. It is much more, it's much more, it's much closer to an aphasia. So this is led to the idea that that, that part of, of cerebellum is, con is in working in concert with the left cerebral hemisphere to produce to, to, to be involved in language production. Um, and one can similarly imagine that there might be uh, regions in the cerebellum that do more other cognitive type things. Uh, that, and the way to think about this is to think about what is the cerebellar transform? What is the chip that the cerebellar cortex provides? For, um, for information. And what it does is, is that it's extremely, it's, it's perfect at, at making associations between an input and, and, an, out, and an output. Um, it makes associations between sensory information and neocortical information, and it is very predictive. And one can imagine that this transform could be applied not just to movement, but say to thought processes or perceptual processes. And that's the way to think about this. Now, I've talked about this in terms of, of adults. Let's think about this in terms of development. And there is a concept um, that has recently been advanced, uh, an old concept, but it been recently advanced by Sam Wang, uh, that, that the cerebellum is involved in uh, this, diastasis. It's my try, um, which meaning that the cerebellum has effects during development that, uh, that, that only take place later on. So imagine that, that as, an, as a baby develops, the cerebellum is not only uh, teaching the, the baby how to, to walk and stand, stand and walk, but also how to process incoming information. And it's setting up the, cere the, the cerebral uh, circuits that are going to allow correct perceptions to occur much in the same way as it sets up the cortical circuitry that allows correct movements to occur. And that the idea then is that if this, if this, uh, service, uh, this developmental service of the cerebellum is interrupted during development, that it can have much, it has 
grave consequences much later during adulthood. And this is what uh, one scenario for what's going wrong in a disease such as autism. Um, in which case, it, it, so for autism, cerebellar damage has a, an odds on, is an odds on risk factor that is sort of on a par with uh, how much smoking uh, produces a risk for getting lung cancer. Cerebellar damage, neonatal cerebellar damage, increases the risk of autism greatly. All right, so the idea is that, that damage to the cerebellum has downstream, downstream organizing effects on neocortical circuits that are responsible for, for our more social and executive type functions, our ability to play well with others. And when that's disrupted during development, it has consequences that can no longer be um, undone or fixed uh, or re, re, uh, redeveloped uh, during adulthood. All right, so, and, and I think that that, you know, it's a very interesting idea. Is it right? Is it perfectly right? Who knows? But it is an idea that is extremely worth exploring, um, and it's, it's a really exciting area of research right now. I want to finally end um, by talking about a, a case that came to light about three years ago. And, um, th you know, this is the latest of maybe uh, under 10 cases that are known of this. And, and this is a case of a, of a young woman who has no cerebellum, so agenesis of, of the cerebellum. Um, it, was, it was brought, it, here's the citation, here's a popular press account of this case. Um, I encourage you to look at both of these. The, 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 the um, report is extremely well written and very interesting. So what happened was that this young woman uh, living in China came as a, I think she was about 23 when she came to the doctor seeking help because she had um, nausea and, and, and vertigo and, and she was vomiting. Um, and they did a bunch of testing. They took a CT scan and, and oh my goodness, there's no cerebellum there. So right where the cerebellum was, there was just CSF. The, C the cerebellum is gone. Now, what else might you imagine would, it, would, would not be there if the cerebellum is gone? Well, indeed, think about it. What's married to the cerebellum? So the, the basis pontus was shrunk. So instead of being a nice bulbous basis pontus, it was a, it's a small one. In addition, there are, there's no superior cerebellar artery, so, um, and that also makes sense. Uh, so what's remarkable about this case is that, okay, so she, she came to their attention at 23. She did not come to their attention at zero or one or two. She walked and talked late when she was around six or seven, but she walked and talked. She socialized enough to get married and have a child who is, uh, completely healthy. Um, and, uh, and, okay, she didn't come to attention until 23. So how, how important can the cerebellum be? And I, and, and I want to end with this because um, I think you could hear, you might have heard about this case, and you might say, oh, well, you know, she, she's pa I'm painting this picture of, of the cerebellum is so critical to all of our movement, and here's this woman who's getting along fine without it. And I think that the correct way to understand this is that um, in the absence of any cerebellum, first of all, she did have problems, okay? She had, she still didn't walk um, without assistance, even at, uh, even after learning how to walk. Uh, um, and her speech was, was, was disordered. Um, uh, but she did. And the way I would understand this is that without the cerebellum, the cortex did a job, did the job of the cerebellum. It didn't do it perfectly. It didn't do it per anywhere near perfectly, but it did the job. And it, it's, the impression that you get is that having a disordered cerebellum uh, is worse than having no cerebellum. And there's another, uh, there, there are a lot of cases of people with very various cerebellar disorders, not just the spinocerebellar ataxias, um, 
but also uh, people with a hypo a, a hypogenesis, a, a very small cerebellum, a disordered cerebellum. And those people are much, uh, appear to be much more um, affected. So there's a, a case, a group of a family in Turkey where the individuals have small uh, cerebellum. They cannot walk um, bipedally. They, they actually walk on, on their hands and, and, and feet. So they walk in a quadruped uh, manner. Um, so, th so I think that despite the fact that this woman thrived without a cerebellum, the answer is that the cerebellum is doing for, for those of us who are lucky enough to have a healthy cerebellum, cerebellum is doing a great deal, certainly for our motor function and probably also for lots of other cognitive, um, less directly motor functions as well.